Hello everyone and welcome to Sci-Fi Zone where we celebrate science fiction movies and TV shows from the past, the present and the future. I'm here today with Claire and MPS and we're coming to you from the wonderful comic book store of Alternate Worlds. In the science fiction television community there's been a lot of history regarding shows that never kind of got their wheels turning to last a long time. Cancelled before their prime. A classic example was the Babylon 5 uh, sequel Crusade, which was cancelled before it even got aired after 13 episodes. So, very, very tragic set of circumstances. And there's another show that also suffered a similar fate uh, and in the end became a cult hit. And Claire's going to tell us all about it. So, Claire, over to you. Well, I'm a bit of a Joss Whedon fan. Um, so, one of my favourite shows, even though, as you say, it was very short-lived and cancelled quite soon, uh, is Firefly. Um, it's been around a while, 2002 it was aired, and I, <laughs> I just love it. <laughs> I think it's a great show. Um, I think it was 14 episodes, yep. uh, so not a long-running show. I mean, Star Trek lasted three seasons before it was cancelled. There's a bit to work with there. Firefly was one short season. Mm. Um, but it was such a great show. Um, the, the casting, I thought, was brilliant. It's one of these ensemble casts, so it's actually a fairly large main cast, but every single one of them is completely individual and has their own place in the show, their own sort of purpose in the show. From the captain, Mal Reynolds, um, who's a bit of a rogue, everyone loves a rogue, um, to Kaylee, who's the engineer. Mm. Uh, I love her introduction to the show. I don't know if you remember it. Yes. She <coughs> wasn't the engineer when the show started. <laughs> she was, uh, shall we say, playing with the engineer <laughs> when the show started. Here's a bit of nerdy talk. <laughs> Do you remember the name of the original engineer? I don't. Besta. So there, there you, you go. go. How okay. good is that? Um, but there were a number of great characters. Do you, did you have a favourite character? I ran, ran between... Well, actually, I'd, there was too many. Yeah, there so, were a lot. So there were times that Mal was great. There were times that Wash was great. There was yep. times that Jane were great. You know, yeah. there were times that you just fell in love with Nara. Nara, yes. Because um, Marina played that so well. Yeah. She was just at times delicate, but she could put Mal back in his place. So a core of steel. Yeah. So purposefully, <laughs> um, uh, from Shepherd. Yeah, they were just all great. They were yeah, all different. Really it wasn't one of the, like you're saying. It wasn't one of these casts that you sort of went, well, he looks and acts like him, and blah blah blah, and they've redone it, and that's the same. No, no, they were completely yeah. all different, and they all had had thing. You know, Zoe was great because she was always behind Mel, even though she was slightly in front of Wash, who was her husband, and you know, it was just that that dynamic between Zoe and Mel. I thought was really interesting because they had been. They'd been together, you know, working together mm. for a very long war, time. Yeah. They knew each other very well. They trusted each other completely. Um, but she was completely in love with another man. Mm. And I think Mal sort of struggled to understand how that could work, I think. Um, but it, it, it showed that you can have those kinds of relationships without it being, without, without it having to be romantic. There was no sexual tension between them at all, none. It just wasn't there. That was between and it worked so beautifully. Because Mel had too many others that he had that, well, that yes. thing with. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, but, it, and it didn't need to work with yeah. every single female he ever met. Because yeah. it didn't, didn't really work with Kaylee either. Because She wasn't interested in him. Well, she had that, that, that devotion and almost fatherly sort of yeah, love that's towards true. him, you know. Cause, that's true. You know, she kisses him on the cheek and says, you know, thank you sort of yeah, thing, yeah. you know. Um, but she's not in there for him. She, no, she, she, her first love is the ship. Yeah, and then the it's engines. the doctor. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, but yeah, that, uh, one of the things that, one of the reasons I think it's so popular and that it worked so well is this great group of characters and, and the actors portraying them mm. as well. But um, I think one of Joss Whedon's strong suits is, is good characters, uh, strong female characters in pretty much all his shows. Um, and, you know, Zoe was second in charge and nobody ever doubted or questioned that. Even Jane, who was the big, tough, manly man, um, you know, there was never any question that Zoe was second in command. Kaylee ran the engine room and she knew what she was doing and, and they always assumed and understood that she was completely capable of the job. You know, that, that was really interesting. Um, they all had their roles and they all, yeah. they all did what they needed to do and there yeah. was never a bit where 
someone doubted the other person. Yeah, and they always got equal equal screen time, not equal screen time, I guess, but um, they felt equal in terms of how often, uh, how their characters were shown and that sort of stuff, the stories around them and that sort of stuff. Um, and then bringing in River and Doctor um, twisted things a little bit, changed the dynamic quite a lot, but but the original crew still, you know, they kept, they stayed the way they were. They, they're, they're the way they worked together really worked really well. I think that works because Joss is a great storyteller. He is. It doesn't matter what yeah. he does, he's written comics, he's written films, yeah. and he also worked with pretty much everyone who works on, worked on Firefly was a minor-ish character in Buffy. Yeah. Okay, so if you remember season seven of Buffy, Mel, who's the captain, played the big bad in mm -hmm. season seven. Yeah. Uh, Jane played the big bad in season five of Angel. Mm -hmm. um, River was actually in the ballet scene in Angel. Yeah. Uh, Zoe was the big bad in Angel season three. Yeah. So he's got all these people he's worked with before and have proven themselves. Well, he's, he's picking people that he thinks he, he's not just got, well, I don't know, but it feels to me like he's paying attention to the people that he works with and then f working with their strengths. The, the ballet thing, for example, for River, the dancing, the way she fights, um, it's, it's, more, it's more shown in the movie Serenity mm. than it is in, in the series Firefly, but she fights like a dancer. She, mm. she, her, her fight scenes are like a choreographed dance and it's just beautiful to well, watch you know and I think that's what he does. I think one of Joss's strengths is pick is, is casting. Hmm. They're, they're all distinct characters and they all get their time to shine. I tend to think that um, the show has a huge cult following because of the shows that came before it, your Buffy's, your Angels and whatever else. I personally Possibly. think if those shows never existed and Firefly just came out as is, it wouldn't have done so well. But Joss had already built up his name and his reputation and his fan following before Firefly came out. Um, the show is really interesting to watch. It's very radical, it's very hardcore science fiction. Mm. And I think that if you're just a casual viewer, you would struggle with it a little bit. I think that background knowledge of who the person is who put this show together and the history of some of the actors uh, in previous Joss shows certainly helped. And I think that it was because of that, he was able to stand on the shoulders of these previous um, uh, projects that uh, he worked on and because that was one of the reasons why I think the show struggled to sort of gain a mainstream audience is because it was extremely high tech science fiction in one element and old western in the mm. other and the two worlds clashed and uh, a lot of people couldn't get over the fact that well, we're flying around in spaceships here but we're riding horses shooting w uh, pistols <laughs> over there there's, there's it was hard to correlate the two links yeah. Well, many of the critics couldn't understand the show, so that's yeah. why it didn't do so well yeah. that way. Uh, in actual fact, I don't remember ever seeing it until after I saw the film Serenity, which was shown here oh, at a special okay. preview. Remember that night? We did, yep. I don't think you were there for that no, night, but back in 2005, Joss Whedon came to Melbourne, showed the film, and uh, filled an, an audience, uh, filled a, a <coughs> cinema. Well, it would have by that point, because it already had yeah. the fan following, yeah. But even though I hadn't seen <coughs> Firefly, I still went to see Serenity. And mm. then I went back and watched the series, okay. and that's how I saw it. So it was completely backwards, mm. but it was still, it was good enough to go back and watch yeah. all the series again. I loved Firefly so much that I bought the entire series on DVD before I'd seen all the episodes on TV. Like, that's how much I loved it from the get-go. And you're right, I, pr I probably watched it partly because I yeah. knew it was Joss Whedon. So having that, having that um, sort of pre-existing mm. support for his work, you're probably mm. right. Well, the irony is, of course, and the history has shown this a lot of times, sometimes when something is cut off in its prime, it actually lasts longer yeah. than it would had it had its normal run. Yeah. So the show is like, uh, has this massive fan following because it only lasted a short period of time. So in the end, its negative had been turned into a positive. And, uh, and unfortunately, as the years roll on and the decades roll on, it'll become more of a distant memory. But for those who were there at the time in the early 2000s, who watched it when it was happening, and were there or part of the whole, um, the fan following trying to get the show um, onto a different network, yeah. um, to them it was, a, it was a big deal. And yeah. it, that's actually a positive that came out of it, which is kind of good. It's almost like Star Trek, as you were saying, in the yeah. 60s, but in the, in the 2000s instead, where the same principle applied, where a show was cut off earlier than it needed to be and, and it just had this massive fan following behind it. So, yeah. And considering Joss had set out seven seasons worth mm. yeah. of filming, you know, yeah. So yeah. Seven, imagine we had seven seasons of it. Yeah. 
See, it's hard to say. It may well, have. Well, that's the thing. It Quite may have just sort of petered out as it went exactly. along. Exactly. So, the yeah. whole thing about it being so short-lived is what we got was brilliant. Like mm. what we got was that first season, and it was setting the scene, and it was telling the stories, and it was new, interesting characters. And once you go beyond that, as you say, quite mm. often they they sort of they don't go the distance. They yeah. some some a lot of shows go up, some, and some, show, yeah, some yeah. shows go down. So you uh, get to a point with a show where it gets to a point where you go, you know what? That should have finished back then. Yeah, exactly. You know, right. And I think maybe two or three seasons would have been really good. Maybe a couple of movies to sort of tie in. But I don't think it would have been any good if I had a run to seven seasons. I think we would have gotten bored with it quite quite quickly with the same sort of stuff going on. Speaking of stopping things, we're going to stop right now. So we can take a quick break and we will be back after these messages. Don't go away. Alternate Worlds has been specialising in comics and collectibles for over 40 years. With a back issue collection of over half a million comics covering the golden age right through to latest releases, including signed and slabbed gems, they also have an enormous graphic novel collection, one of the largest ranges of manga in the country, as well as toys, statues and pops, and new items are arriving every Wednesday. Each month, Alternate Worlds hosts its own premium comic day, where all the rare treasures are put on display for inspection and purchase. The store also runs regular tournaments and competitions for both comic and gaming fans. And for local and interstate and international buyers, the Alternate Worlds website features their complete range of products. So whether you come in online or in store, visit them soon. And welcome back to our Firefly discussion. There's a couple of things that I wanted to bring up that I thought were um, very impressive uh, for the show. Two things uh, were, and this is why I think a lot of people really got dialed into it, was the used look of the mm. universe, especially yep. the ship. It wasn't gleaming, yep. it wasn't shiny, it had been battered and bruised. And Kept breaking down. And <laughs> a lot of people have sort of found in a lot of science fiction shows that they can really connect into something that has a very used and abused look to it. And this show definitely had that, not just with the costumes, but with all the hardware, the technology, and the fact that everything wasn't like the latest and the greatest. And when you see from the outer rim uh, areas to the Alliance core worlds, c complete contrast. It's yeah. almost like first world, third world uh, countries. Yeah. So, uh, and I think a lot of people really sort of got connected into that too, which is really, really cool. Well, it's one of the first ones that um, the main ship isn't like a military ship no. or a, a yeah, it has no guns, no weaponry, ship. which was kind of groovy. Yeah, yeah, they they have uh, there's a certain amount of protection, but what I'm talking about not so much is weapons, but who owns it. Yeah, it's not owned by a big yep. conglomeration or a government or a military organisation who tend to keep things shiny and clean yep. and everything has to be up to date. It's owned by a guy who is struggling to get by. Mm. You know, this is his his way of earning a living yeah. is this ship moving things around moving people around smuggling is part of yeah. it but you know he, he does legitimate stuff as yeah. well yeah. um so it's quite interesting that that whole view of the ship it looks much more like a home like you yeah. can you can really believe that people actually live there whereas even even in Star Trek, for example, you see into their quarters and they're, even their quarters are, mm. they're military, they're, yep. they're Spartan, they're clean and shiny and everything's perfect and neat and everything works as, unless they need it not to for the story. Whereas in Firefly, the ship Serenity, um, it, as you say, it's battered and bruised, it's been around the universe, it's had accidents, it's run, you know, think they keep running out of fuel and they keep running out of parts and yeah. I loved yeah. that. It, it feels more real in a way. One thing it didn't do was fly into an atmosphere where it was raining and if you're hearing some noises <laughs> at the moment it's currently raining outside. Yes. <laughs> um, I did find two things that uh, it was interesting that you look at their lifestyle and on a TV show you could say what a great lifestyle that must be but it is a lifestyle of survival yeah. so it's not glitterous, glittery and glamorous and enjoyable and if you were to delve into that in-universe sort of life you probably find it to be quite difficult and, and very. very depressing in a lot of ways where it's just like living day to day um, and uh, so yeah it's one thing where the, the show actually makes that more appealing than probably, than probably what it would be in real life so yeah. and, you, and you see that in the pilot episode where Kaylee gets given a box by by Shepard yep. and and he she turns around and you don't see what it is till quite some time later yeah and the the simple act of being given fresh strawberries yes. is enough to make her to pay his passage to, to make her glow yeah. yeah essentially you know and you don't see that very often there wasn't too many 
other items, but that was the, the main thing. It was just as simple as a box of strawberries. Yeah. Um, and the other thing that I found really intriguing, and this is a very rare thing, even for uh, TV shows and movies, is the fact that they went with the no sound in space thing. So the ship made no sound at all when they're firing guns and whatever else. There's no noise. And that's... A lot of people are so used to having sounds in space, even though in the show it was actually um, scientifically correct because mm. there was no uh, sound. And I thought that was actually a really good touch that yeah. they did that. Mm. Um, whenever you have a movie or a TV show where there's no sound in space, you automatically think of 2001 A Space Odyssey because they sort of pretty much pioneered that concept, I believe. But uh, I thought that was actually kind of groovy. And it wasn't until uh, Serenity, when you actually had the battle against the Reavers, that you finally got sounds. And I don't know why they put that in. I, th I think they think, they Maybe. thought that for a, a battle scene, yeah. you needed to have guns firing and explosions and all the rest of it. Um, just so the audience could dial into it because yeah. if all of that had been in silence that probably would have been a bit hard for people to deal with yeah. but uh, keeping it all quiet was actually very very cool. Uh, the Reavers were an interesting concept yeah. in themselves. Um, I mean you're talking outer space and you're talking western, you're talking about um, the, sort of the old frontier type yeah. thing where these planets are um, still being settled, they're not built up you know, no. technologically sound, we, hence the horses yes. and all that sort of stuff. Um, and I think that worked really well. I mm. think on the colonies, on the planets, um, you saw frontier towns. You saw the kinds of things that would exist somewhere that was still being colonised, that was still being built up, that was still um, developing in a way. Um, yes, they've got spaceships to get them there, but once you get there, you don't yeah. have. It, you're not going to have everything you need to just yeah. suddenly have this amazing society. And how some are more advanced than others, and and the money yeah. differentiation. But having the Reavers, having this something that we don't really understand. We don't know where they've come from. We we don't know why they are the way they are. We know they're people, sort of. You kind of get a hint of it from the film. Yeah, well, the, the film, the the film, film goes into it a yeah. lot more. Yeah. I, I'm talking in Firefly sp yeah, specifically. Yeah. Um, they're, they're like a, an enemy. They're, they're like, um, I don't know. I, I just really liked that they were so dangerous and scary, but also mysterious. You didn't mm. just know what they were. They weren't just you know, yep. a monster that lived on the planet. They mm. were, and they were us. Yeah. We brought our enemies with us, mm. which I thought, really good, really interesting. Um, I use that word a lot, <laughs> mm. but it is interesting because I think that's what would happen. Mm. Um, we talked in a previous episode about the psychology of, of colonising a planet yep. and you would get people who would go crazy. You would yeah. get people who wouldn't be able to handle it. And I think the Reavers being sort of ourselves, um, I think that worked really well. And then having the movie Serenity mm. tell that story yep and explain where they came from and how they came about. Mm. Um, it was such a good way to, to round up the show. So if you want to keep the mystery as to who the Reavers are, just don't watch the film. Yeah. Uh, and there's a lot more we could speak about with regards to Firefly. Yeah. If you haven't seen the show, it's only 14 episodes, so you can actually plough through it in a single day. Well worth having a look at. It's something yeah. completely different. And uh, you'll probably find that once you have watched it, you'll jump on board with the whole fan phenomenon that other people have done as well. We've got to wrap this episode up. So if you haven't done so already, be sure to subscribe to our channel and click on the bell for all the latest updates and exciting things that are going on around the place. Next time around, we are going to be discussing something that's very, very exciting and we'll tell you all about it when we get there. So in the meantime, make sure you stay in the zone. Bye for now. Grr,